So I, I, let me just say that, that uh, these days, those of you who, who, who've known me in the past, I've been at the Quran Institute. And the past couple of years, I've moved uh, two-thirds time up to 21st Street and Fifth Avenue, and, and uh, I have another research group that I'm building at Flatiron, which is a new uh, division within the Simons Foundation. That's an independent research institute. And uh, there I have uh, some people that some of you know, uh, Sebastian Furtauer, uh, who was a student with Frank Uliker and, uh, and then did uh, a postdoc with Sriram, actually for I think six months, uh, is now permanent staff there. Okay, so uh, I think given that I, I really have 40, 45 minutes, I'm gonna stick to one topic. And it's going to be quite different, I think, uh, not I think, I know it's going to be quite different from uh, most of the other talks uh, that we've been listening to, which has been, been very nice. Oh, let me just say, too, I'd like to, to I, I have to give the, the obligatory but, but heartfelt uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's really exciting to come to India. And especially I'd like to thank Sriram. I had... Uh, been under the uh, misconception that my assistant at Flatiron had suddenly gained an, an extra level of competency in arranging, arranging my travel. And it turned out it was Sriram kind of working directly with her behind the scenes, making sure that everything was going through. So, so thank you, Sriram. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about Spindle. And uh, in particular, I'm going to be talking about transport processes inside of eukaryotic cells and, and the uh, kind of model organism that, that we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about is going to be C. elegans. And uh, this is joint work. This is what I'll describe to you today is, is a uh, joint uh, modeling and experimental uh, project that we're just finishing up now between my group at, at Flatiron and, and Dan's at Harvard. And so the uh, two that are uh, especially involved, aside from Dan and myself, are Azan Nazik Das, who just left Flatiron and moved to UNC Chapel Hill, and a uh, very gifted experimental graduate student of Dan's, uh, Haiyan Wu. Okay, so uh, let me just say, we all have to have our active matter slide. So I'm going to be talking, as I said, mostly about things going on in the cell, and in particular, transport processes that are making use of some part of the cytoskeleton involving microtubules. And as, as far as uh, active matter is concerned, the cell and the cytoskeleton, as I say here, provided some of the foundational examples of, of active matter, what we often think of as inspiration. So the, the cell cortex, the formation of the spindle, other organelles within the cell that have jobs to do, the, there's a lot of work these days in studying the nucleus as an active material. And so the ingredients that go into uh, these kinds of things, these organelles in the cell, biopolymers, motor proteins, crosslinkers, have become very studied both within and outside of the cell uh, for their role in things like self-assembly of spindle or its self-regulation, self-healing properties, and things like that. And so some other part of my work, which I won't talk about today, has to do with modeling materials if you like, that are, that are made out of pieces of the cell. And so uh, this is actually from uh, Dan Needleman from his lab. This is joint work that we had done with Peter Foster in understanding why under some situations microtubule suspensions can be contractile rather than extensile as we often tend to think of them when they're in an ordered phase. Uh, you can study things, uh, nice processes that were, were experimentally people are starting to get their hands on actually uh, measuring things such as polarity sorting, which is thought to give rise to extensile stresses in experimental systems like Zonomir Dojix. And I, I put this little one in here. Uh, sorry, I'm not so, I'm not so uh, good at manipulating this kind of thing, so I have to go back and actually run things by hand. But I put this one in here for Sriram because this is uh, a recent uh, experiment by Zonomir. Uh, in which he takes one of his, his active gel suspensions with microtubules that are lined up into bundles, and he shear aligns it. And upon shear aligning, you see this transverse instability, which is, I think, as far as I know, the first really nice, clean experimental instantiation of, of the instability that uh, is identified in, in that classic paper in 2002, I believe. <laughs> 
Okay, but what I'm really going to talk about uh, today is a bit of that system, but giving rise to what I think are some really interesting problems in biomechanics. And we're going to be looking at these kinds of things, both through experiment and through really stripped down uh, kind of models. And so, again, uh, this is um, what I really want to talk about are some of the events, transport, migration, centering, maintenance of spindle position, things like that, uh, spindle oscillations, those kinds of transport processes I want to, I want to talk about as, a, as kind of a biomechanics problem. And what you're seeing here is, uh, you know, things that are leading up to cell division, but what you're, what you're seeing here is a very nice, beautiful movie from the Sugimoto lab in Tokyo. And what it was showing over and over and over again is, uh, I'll start here, is the migration of the male and female pronucleus into the center of the cell, the formation of the spindle, condensation of chromosomes and segregation, the elongation of the spindle, and then it moves into oscillations, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. It's not really a functional thing, but it's, it's useful to get your hands on forces that are involved, and then from there goes on into cell division. And so here it's shown in, in kind of schematic form. There's kind of the structure, uh, physical structure of the, of the objects that are involved. We have, in this case, in pronuclear migration, we have the male and female pronuclei fused together at the posterior side of the cell. Uh, there are centrosomes that came along with the male that have moved into a certain position on, on the pronuclear complex, and that's involved in moving that into the center of the cell and then rotating that structure so that the centrosomal axis is aligned up with the AP axis. So there it is in proper position. At that point, the mitotic spindle forms, and you get segregation of the sister chromatid pairs, and then you get spindle elongation. Various things happen then, and then that leads up to cell division. So those are kind of the prototypical events, the archetypal events, if you like, that are associated, at least in this particular organism, uh, with the lead up to the first cell division. So we want to understand it's known that this structure, the, the so-called centrosomal array or the astral microtubules that are nucleating out of the centrosome there, it's known that these are intimately involved in all of these processes. If you knock those down, if you ablate them, you do various things, none of this will happen in a, in a viable way. And so, we, so I'll, I'll tell you about some work in trying to understand how all this is happening. What is grabbing onto microtubules and making everything move and so on and so forth. Okay, so having told you without evidence that the centrosomal array is intimately involved in whatever force transduction is going on to move all this around, uh, let me just say that there have been three basic force mechanisms that have been proposed that are involved in all of these processes. It's involved in, my, say, migration, uh, centering, assuming proper position, spindle elongation, oscillations, all of these things. Uh, depend on those microtubules. And microtubules can exert forces upon payloads to which they're attached in various ways. And here are three examples. Uh, one which was talked about yesterday, actually, has to do with uh, nucleation forces. So microtubules are undergoing uh, dynamic instability, and so they can grow. And, and as they're growing and polymerizing, they can exert polymerization forces on things that they run up a butt. So that's one way. Uh, a second is it's known that on the cortex of the cell and other places, for example, also on, on the uh, nuclear membrane, it's known that there are dynines that are bound there. And they can grab onto dynines, or rather the dynines can be anchored and they can grab onto microtubules and they can yank them. They can kind of reel them in. That's another. Uh, a third that's been proposed, and there's a whole set of names and models that go with all of these. If you, if you want to read a, a recent review, I will recommend myself. Uh, but at any rate, a, a, a third model is, it's also known that organelles that are floating around inside of the cytoplasm can be coated with dynine. So here I keep saying dynine, dynine. Uh, but they can be coated with dynines, and these dynines can attach onto microtubules. They're minus N directed motor proteins, so they will march towards centrosomes as they drag a payload through the fluid, Newton's third law says it has to pull the object it's attached to in the opposite direction. And so you can also have 
transport processes of payloads on microtubules directly moving objects, payloads around. And so these have all been proposed in all three of these cases, all these transport processes in, as possible sources of how you move something. So it turns out that it's very difficult, as you might imagine, to measure forces directly inside of a cell. And there's been very, very little. In fact, I think that this is only, there's only been two really that have, have really directly measured forces with units and all those kinds of things. And uh, so they're very rare, but there's, there's been a set of very nice, beautiful experiments that came out of Joe Howard's lab just last year. And they, they are uh, heroic, really. They consumed two postdocs and five or six years of work. And so uh, what they were able to do was to uh, get C. elegans embryos to have taken up magnetic beads, and then they could have a magnet, and they could, they could exert then a force on this. And so what they were able to do was say, here's an example. They've gotten a magnetic bead right at a centrosome. Actually, this should be flipped over because they're always doing this on the posterior side. But anyway, right, there's a magnetic bead that they've maneuvered to be stuck up next to a centrosome. Then they, they pull on it, and basically they do a creep strain measurement. And so this magnet is calibrated. You know how much force you're exerting on this. And so, for example, uh, what they were able to show is that if they exert 16 piconewtons for 10 seconds, they can get a 2 micron pole displacement out of that. And if they let it go, then they find that it, it relaxes back more or less to its uh, initial position. So this is really like a spring dash pot is really how it effectively behaved. And so uh, here's actually an example from their experiment. They only have a little bit of time uh, to make this all work. I should say that this is all taking place in a particular stage of spindle behavior, which is prometaphase or metaphase before things start to get more complicated, the spindle starts to elongate, other processes come, come in. It's a stage where things are relatively stationary and it's kind of holding place, waiting for other things to happen. So in that little bit of time that they have to do all this, 10 minutes, say, they do a series of, of these creep-strain relationships. They fit something to a spring dash pot model, and they're able to pull out things like what is a spring coefficient, what is a drag coefficient, whatever that means in this particular system, because there could be all sorts of sources of drag. And uh, from that, you can calculate a relaxation time and so on. They were also uh, able to show that if they could, there, there's, a, there's a particular RNAi uh, perturbation, GPR12 knockdown, that will uh, make dining motors on the cortex less efficacious, either by reducing the number of motors or perhaps by reducing the, the binding rate of microtubules to them. It's not so clear. But what they showed, for example, was it, that if they could knock down cortical pulling, this actually led to a stiffening of the spring. And they interpret this as, as meaning that uh, really cortical uh, pulling was kind of an anti-centering effect. And they interpret this as meaning that the dominant force in all this going on was a, was a pushing force on, on the boundary that was coming from nucleation of, of microtubules against it. So if you like, model one. It's very nice work. So uh, just to give a plug for myself, I'm going to give a, give a bit of background. So there's, there's also been relatively, in addition to, to not a lot of, of direct force measurements, as far as I know only one in this case, uh, there's not been a lot of, of work in kind of fairly uh, realistic, whatever that can mean inside of the cell, fairly realistic kind of physical modeling of these, these various types of processes is quite difficult as a problem. I should say where you're, where you're going to see now is that, that I come from a very different tradition uh, from those, most of the people who have given talks uh, here. I really come from a physical applied mathematics computational fluid dynamics background. So I like to construct models and I like to simulate and, and things like this. And so you'll see that here. And so uh, my group has been involved in trying to build computational tools for actually looking at some of these, these models and looking at their consequences. And so uh, let me give you an example. I really think of it as a big fluid structure interaction problem. So what you see here up at the top is uh, our first shot at this uh, 
the postdoc at the time, Tamar Shinar, our first shot at this of instantiating this kind of cytoplasmic pulling model. And so what you're seeing here in three, is a three-dimensional fluid dynamics calculation of a payload, that blue thing, we'll think that's the pronuclear complex, and we have somewhere around 50 completely rigid microtubules that are attached onto force generators in the cytoplasm, and they're dragging it off towards the center. And that's actually a model that was originally proposed by Kimura and Kimura, and we turned it into a, into a kind of real computational fluid dynamics problem. What we were able to show is that we did a lot of things wrong, I would say. Uh, we, I could go into what the defects of this are, though I don't think there's a point, but it did what is actually observed. The fact that you had more microtubules on one side of the cell meant that there was a force imbalance. You had more force generators that could grab onto it. It would drag it over. And then there was a torque instability because of the oblong nature of the, con of the confinement that actually made it mechanically stable to turn itself so that the centrosomes are lined up at the AP axis. Okay. So that was, that was very interesting, but there were lots of things wrong. As I said, too few microtubules, they couldn't bend. Maybe that's important, maybe it's not. Uh, one big defect is because of the computational method we were using, we couldn't afford to resolve the fact that transfer mo transverse motion of microtubules give rise to drag. So let me, let me just tell you, a, 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 for those of you who really study the Stokes equations, I'm not sure how many of you in here you know, like really study the Stokes equations, maybe in the way that I do. But microtubules are long, skinny things. They're really skinny things. They're only 24 nanometers in diameter, and they can be you know, microns in, in scale. But they move through a Stokesian fluid. What that means is that they drag. You, you pull one of these guys around, you drag a lot of fluid with it. You only need something like three or four microtubules the size of the pronucleus, pronuclear complex to have the same drag, actually, as the pronuclear complex itself. So they may, be long, they may be very skinny, but in the Stokes equations, drag goes on the longest length scale of the object. So it can be long and skinny, but it's, it's really causing you a lot of effort to move it. So you really need to get this part right, and we didn't do that right. So since then, with, with ASON, Nozick Dost, we built a whole new suite of software. And uh, I'll say a little bit about it on the next slide, just a very little bit. But what it lets us do is incorporate microtubule flexibility. It lets us include transverse drag. It lets us uh, compute with order of a thousand or more microtubules and to do it efficiently and accurately. And this is all based on the fact that we're dealing with this we're assuming that the cytoplasm is a Newtonian fluid. As soon as you're dealing with the homogeneous constant coefficient Stokes equation, there's a whole set of beautiful numerical methods based on boundary integral techniques, just as you would have for potential problems for Laplace's equation. Yes. Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, of course, I haven't shown you anything yet. So what surface do you mean? I should ask you that. So the eggshell. So where all of this is going on is after cortical motions have more or less ceased. That happens earlier than this, so we're really just taking a no-slip condition. It's actually very easy to incorporate, and we're working with Sebastian now to put in kind of a, uh, an actin cortex model into it. So, uh, so it just lets you do a lot of things. Let me just put it that way. It's a huge step up. And so here is a simulation of model three being pulled by cytoplasmic dynein, so it's the same one up above, but with a thousand microtubules. There's a simulation of pushing by microtubule nucleation against the boundary. And this is a third simulation of, of pulling by cortical dynein's. So we were able to instantiate versions of all three of these models and study vari various a variance of them, and this is in an MBOC paper that, that has appeared this year. And the, one of the things that you learn from that, actually, is that all three of these mechanisms can achieve proper position on kind of physiologically reasonable timescales with not crazy assumptions on polymerization force or on the strength of, of dynings that are pulling. But one thing that differentiates them 
is that because of the nature of the forces that are being exerted on the microtubules, they might have different conformations. So for example, pulling, pushing against a boundary can lead to buckling, while pulling from a boundary does not, because one is extensile and one is compressive. And the other is that, this is, this is I think, very interesting, is that the, this kind of being pulled by cytoplasmic dining is really a version of a swimmer problem. This is a force-free object, which has little motors attached to it that's dragging it around. And so this case really looks like a puller that's being pulled across the cell, something, something like clamidomonas, but it's in a confinement. While the other two cases, you're really moving force from the boundary to move an object through microtubules, and that really looks like a stokeslet that's being applied to the payload. So these different mechanisms can actually have quite different fluid flows because they could correspond to force-free and not force-free types of, of propulsion, if you like. Okay. Now, I think I'm going to... This, this is really my... <laughs> this is the numerical method slide, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this. Okay. Oh, let me, let, me, let me say one thing. Why do you want to do boundary integral methods? What boundary integral methods do for you is that they move the solution of the Stokes equations in the bulk to solving singular integral equations on all the boundaries confining or immersed within the fluid. And so what you do is you reduce the dimension of the problem from three to two at the cost of having to do some singular integrals. But that's a big save, okay? So it becomes much cheaper, especially when you can bring in things like fast multipole methods to handle all the end-body interactions for you within it. It's really like a big, you know, end-body gravitation problem, really, in flavor. It's the same thing. Okay, so along comes, comes Dan. We'd been talking about this stuff for years. And uh, so Dan decided to start looking at these problems, and, and he came up with a, a very nice laser ablation uh, technique where he could basically cut microtubules in kind of arbitrary surfaces inside of the cell with very minimal damage, okay? And this is, this is, this is really all run by, by his student, Haiyan Wu. And so what you're seeing here is a spindle that's in anaphase, so this is kind of late stage, and it's elongated, and it's in this kind of rocking motion. And right there, it's being cut right there, and you can see there's kind of a rebound going down rebound going down. So what he's able to do is to go in and, and to cut the ropes that are attaching the centrosome and the spindle to whatever is there. It could be cutting them from being able to exert nucleation forces on a boundary, or cutting them connecting to dynings that are anchored to the cortex, or cutting from dynings floating around on organelles inside of the cell. So. Very, this, is, this has been used before, but I think Dan has kind of taken it to, a, to another, another level. So, what he, what he decided to do was, uh, as, as others have done at least theoretically, is to really look at, at, at kind of the, the case where you see the most going on, which is spindle oscillations, which is kind of late. And it turns out to have some nice properties I'll show you a bit more in a second, that make it especially amenable to trying to suss out, you know, do you have pulling forces? Do you have pushing forces? Are they cytoplasmic? Are they not cytoplasmic? And these kinds of things. So let me just show you uh, the dynamics of spindle oscillation. Now let me just say, spindle oscillation is not something you see in all organisms, but you do see it typically in C. elegans. And it's associated, actually, I should say, too, with, as you move into anaphase, it's associated with an, enrich, an enrichment of dynein on the cortex, on the posterior side. As you move into anaphase, you get more dynein that start to populate, more force generators on one side, and it starts to oscillate. So here is what spindle oscillation looks like, and here you're keeping track of the displacements of the two centrosomes. You get this little burst of chatter of a damped oscillation, like a chirp or something. That's what it characteristically looks like. And it's the case that each one of those oscillations is usually you know, about 30 seconds, something like that. 
So the idea is to take that and to laser ablate various regions around the centrosome as it's in various stages of this oscillation and see how it responds. If it's moving along and it's being pushed and you cut below, that's going to do something different than if you cut above. Or likewise, if it's being pulled, it's going to be a different kind of response to that. Okay, so there's, there's say, an amplitude oscillation. Here it's moving up, here it's moving down. And so grab the two most obvious places to grab, the peak of an oscillation where it's zero velocity, and then as it's passing back through the midplane where its velocity is greatest. Okay, and so, and then do cuts above and below. See what happens. Here's what happens when you cut at the midpoint. And here, the centrosome is moving down. If you cut below, then it rebounds back up towards the top. And then it's like you did a phase shift on the whole thing, and then it will recover an oscillation. But you stop the oscillation, and it rebounds back up. On the other hand, if you cut above, it has hardly any effect at all. So this is an argument that, at least if you're talking about forces at this stage in the oscillation, you're really dominated by pulling, not by pushing. So let's go to the peak of the oscillation. And so at the peak of the oscillation, you have zero velocity, so the forces should all be in balance above and below on the, on the centrosome. If you cut below when it's at the peak, then it just stalls and it moves back up towards the top. On the other hand, if you cut above, again, it has very little effect when it's reached its peak and it's just about to head back down. So again, that would seem to indicate that at this stage in the oscillation, again, pulling forces dominate. There's other types of cuts they do, which are much more complicated, cup, what are called cup cuts around the center zone, so they knock out the influence of, of microtubules that are going transversely off to, the, off to the act, to the pole of the axis. It's all the same. What seems to come up over and over again is that during this stage, pulling seems to be the dominant effect, not pushing. Is this pulling coming from the cortex or is it coming from the cytoplasm? Okay, so uh, this is where we get to bring in a little bit of fluid mechanics. And uh, so if we have cortical pulling, that means I'm just reeling this guy in at the boundary, okay? Or if I have something that's moving sideways, then the, then the microtubules are kind of passive objects. They're transmitting force, but they're just dragging through the fluid. So the fluid and the microtubules move together. On the other hand, if I have transport of cargoes along the microtubules, then that will create flows, and you see this in the simulations, actually, that will create flows, cytoplasmic flows, along microtubules. So you can simulate kind of mock-ups of these. These are not full simulations, but you can simulate mock-ups of these in our, in our code. And uh, so here is showing the flow that happens in, a, in kind of a model of what the flow should look like if you have cortical pulling. So basically here, everything's moving down here. There's a force being applied there and a force moving up there. And everything's being dragged down as it starts to rotate. So microtubules and fluids move in the same direction. You just see it as evidence there. You can do a version of that for cytoplasmic pulling. And what you can see then is that you tend still to be dominated by these flows that are being created by the cargoes dragging in towards the centrosome. So flows are along and among the microtubules. Yes. So uh, you can you can do various. Uh, let me. I'll come back to that a little bit. I think more later. Okay. If I don't, then remind me. I want to kind of finish this story smoothly. Okay. So here's what you do. In another heroic experiment, using kind of the same ideas as getting the magnetic beads in, uh, Hyend and Dan were able to get nanodiamonds. They would inject them into the gonads of the worm, and they were taken up by the eggs. And if you were lucky, you got a bunch of them. And you could do PIV on these. And so there they are. There's those sparkling little things. There you have spindle elongation. Everything starts to rock. And you can see more or less, you can already see the whole cytoplasm is just moving up and down with that. 
Let me just, well, okay, I was about to answer a question, but I'm going to just keep, <laughs> it's going to keep going. Okay, and so um, here's kind of a, an amalgamation of, of the data. So I think this is uh, an average velocity field over about 20 embryos. And so that's the, the velocity field that you get as this posterior centrosome is moving down. And comparing that with our, our kind of mocked up version of cytoplasmic pulling in the full model. And again, so the fluid flows again seem completely consistent with being cortical pulling rather than cytoplasmic flows. So that seems to be the main actor so far in this. So microtubules and fluid are moving in the same direction, suggesting cortical pulling dominates and dry spindle oscillations. And the question is, but, but how? How might all this be happening? And so this is a complicated slide. But what we, what we did is we put together kind of a proof of concept model for spindle oscillations arising from cortical pulling. And let me just tell you, uh, I'll show you a picture of it real quick. Just so you can see an idea. Here's the model. It's a 3D model. Fluid mechanics is handled only in a cursory way here as a drag coefficient on various objects. This is not a, anywhere close to what I showed you before, but that I say is kind of proof of concept. And there, what it's doing is it's nucleating microtubules. Some set of those, the red ones, are connecting to force generators on the boundary. And they stay there for a bit and then detach at some rate. And what you see is that if the density of force generators is high enough, this will start to oscillate. And in fact, it will oscillate rather naturally. You have to adjust for the frequency, kind of, but the, or rather adjust for the amplitude, but, but it oscillates very naturally at about this uh, correct frequency, 30 seconds or so, that you see in the experiments. That's what the model looks like. Let me tell you what goes into it. Jeez. I feel like, yeah, you were, you, everybody has the same reaction. So, so, so here are the things that go into the model. Uh, we have two centrosomes where we just connect them by, we don't, we don't really model the, the, the spindle now, we just model as a rigid spring between the centrosomes. And uh, microtubules nucleate at these centrosomes. They grow at a growth velocity is about 0.7 microns per second. That's measured. And they also undergo catastrophe, so they'll suddenly start to depolymerize. Uh, you assume that motors are located on the cortex with, with higher posterior density. That's something that's observed that happens as you move into anaphase. Microtubules hit and bind to a motor. If they do, they have a pulling force. We have a discrete distribution of motors, and each motor uh, only gets one. So there can be competition, if you like, exclusion for motors. And that can be an important part of this. Uh, centros okay, I said all these kinds of things. Forces some to drag centrosomes around the cytoplasm. That's kind of the, the gist of the whole model. I guess it's what you would call a stochastic simulation. And so there, as I said, out of this model, you can, you can tune it. You always get the, the frequency about right, but you can tune it to get the right amplitudes. And because there are more force generators on the posterior side, you get higher oscillations on one side than, than on the other. And in fact, the uh, oscillations on, on the anterior side are really coming from the spring coupling, mostly between them. OK, so here's kind of a rough argument uh, as to why all this works. So uh, if, your force, if you have enough of a pulling force, then you can actually achieve motion of the centrosome at speeds that are higher than the growth velocity. If you can do that, then you'll, you have, will have moved away microtubules on the downstream side of that, and they can't grow fast enough back in order to hit the cortex, so they become detached. And so you lose pulling forces on, on the side that you're moving away from. And so uh, meanwhile, as you're moving up, just, you have to think of this geometrically, as you're, as you're moving up, then you have this set of, of, of force generators you're kind of competing for, but you're seeing a smaller and smaller set of them because more and more of the cortex is becoming then part for pulling, for bringing you back down, just by the geometry of the cell. And so as it, as it moves up, the centrosome also slows 
And that gives the microtubules that were detached from the bottom a chance to get back and, and hit again and to start the whole process again. And so this model very, because things are kind of happening on the, on the order of this growth velocity, that's kind of setting a scale, there is a natural oscillation frequency that comes out of it, which is VG over D, where D is the size. And that's kind of the, the basic frequency that we see out of this. And it matches with the experiments. And so then there were uh, kind of telling you that this is really what's going on. There are some very nice experiments that Hai En did, where she did a GPR 1, 2, knock, or 1 knockdown again. And she separated all the data according to the centrosomal speed. And here she's plotting centrosomal speed versus maximal displacement. You get a nice linear thing, which is consistent with having a fixed frequency. And what you find is that when the centrosomal speed hits the order of the growth velocity, it stops. Because now microtubules will always have enough of a chance to grab on and not become detached. So it's nice mechanically consistent. Here's another thing that we actually predicted out of the, out of the model, and then uh, they went and checked it. It turned out to be correct, fortunately. And that is that as you're, as you're moving upwards, your nucleating microtubules are going towards the cortex. Most of them are not hitting force generators, and they're just depolymerizing. But we have a constant rate of nucleation. So what that means is that as you move up, you keep the, you're, you're, the closer you get, you're hitting with more microtubules, you have more microtubules that are depolymerizing. You get a reduction in the number of microtubules. And so this is showing then what happens if you just measure, if you like, this is from the experiment, this is showing if you measure tubulin luminance, total luminance, you see you have this, as you move towards peak, then the luminance on the upside here as it's moving up decreases, and then it goes back up as it's on the other side of the cycle. And that's exactly what we see in our, in our model. OK, so now uh, I started late in the game. Now we're going to move to the middle of the whole process. I've just you know, convinced you polling is everything, at least in anaphase. And now you can go back to the earlier stages and see what's, what's happening there. And so they went back and they looked at uh, pro-metaphase and metaphase, those kind of spindle maintenance era. And again, I won't go through it, but cutting again shows that there's a predominance of pulling forces. You get the same types of behavior. You cut on one side, it's kind of sitting there, you cut on one side, and the center zone moves in that direction because you've lost pulling on that side. Or moves in the other direction, sorry. And so uh, in this period, there's also fewer force generators. And so within our model, if we reduce the number of force generators, that removes the oscillations. And it starts to behave like a spring dash pod, consistent with, with uh, Joe's experiments. And what they also found when they do the nano diamond flow uh, reconstruction is that when you're in early metaphase, it's very disorganized. It only becomes organized when you start to move into elongation. And that's quite different from in our simulation. If you have cytoplasmic pulling just in maintenance phase, you have these persistent flow currents going on to the inside. So that's not what you see. So again, it seems that in, in this period, again, it's, uh, you're, you're still seem to be dominated by, by pulling, not by, in fact, cortical pulling, rather than either cytoplasmic pulling or pushing against the cortex. Now, this is, <laughs> this is the part that is really brutal. I loved this because it showed that my model was completely wrong. It's just like a definitive experiment. And so this is when they went back and they looked at what was going on in pronuclear migration, that period where the pronuclear complex is moving into the center of the cell and rotating. And so in this model that we had built based on this Kimura and Kimura conception, you're being moved over because you have all these cytoplasmic dynings that are attached and you have more than one. Huh. Yeah, I was wondering what that phone was. It happened in every... I thought, who is this guy who has his phone on all the time? In every talk, his phone goes off. <laughs> yeah. Now I know. <laughs> okay. So, um, so again, uh, you can do various cutting experiments. It's all consistent with pulling. But then they did the following. They just did a big cut on a surface on the anterior side that this whole thing was moving towards. 
So what that did is it cut the microtubules off from the surface, but if there were cytoplasmic dynings that were dragging things around, it would leave them undisturbed. But that's not what happened. And so what happened instead was that when you did that, the, the pronuclear complex just stopped. It just stopped translating because it wasn't being pulled over there. So as I said, brutally discards the cytoplasmic pulling model. I think that's, that's absolutely correct. Very, I, I just love this, this experiment. I mean, if you, you know, you want to be in a position where if you're wrong, there's nothing to argue about. You're not, you know, defending some losing position, right? That's a little humiliating. You're just, you're just wrong. Okay, so, so that's kind of my summary. And then I'm going to take a few minutes and just show you a movie, another kind of movie. So, uh, so kind of the summary, a combination of theory and experiment suggests that really what's going on through all this process is cortically bound dynein force generators. They seem to be the, the, the kind of source of force that's consistent with all of these various measurements in our, in our simulations. And so, uh, you know, this is really for me. I don't think most of you would care about this too much. But uh, could, could this be incorporated into these large-scale simulations to basically give you a soup to nuts, as we say, from beginning to end? Soup to nuts is an American construction phrase that I don't know if is used outside of the continental US, but uh, to, in, into these large-scale simulations. Uh, can surface-bound force generation explain other phenomena? And, and there's some other things that we're looking at now that once you think about having uh, dynein bound to a surface, you, you can explain, we think, other things that are going on as well. And I should say that there's, we have a nice reduced uh, one-dimensional kinetic model, which I didn't have time to put together. I wouldn't have time to show, uh, that reproduces a lot of, out of this in a very much reduced setting. So uh, I know I'm supposed to stop now. I just want to show you, show you two movies. Okay. So now this is, as I said, this is, this is transport processes by kind of active things. Nice and clean kind of biomechanics problem. So uh, another thing we've been working on is trying to understand some experiments of Alexandra Zadowska at NYU, who uh, during her postdoc at Harvard was able, was able to show that there are kind of coherent displacement domains that you see in the dynamics of, of chromatin in, in interphase. And so uh, this is just a couple of movies where we've been, where we have conjectured that some of her results might be explained by the action of motors of various sorts inside of the nucleus that exert dipolar forces of certain sorts. And this is ongoing work. We're just starting to get it written up now, but the movies are fabulous. And I'll just tell you, give you the bare gist of it. What we have is a big chain, a big inextensible chain, all right? And it's confined within a sphere, which we're not showing. And this chain is, as I said, inextensible, so you can have tensile forces to keep them stretching or compressing. And we have little things mock up motors that will exert dipolar forces. Say it will grab a piece of the chain and yank it and have an equal and opposite force on the, on the fluid around it, and then you watch the whole thing. And these motors have an on and off cycle. They have a K on and a K off, and you randomly choose links of the chain that you do this to. This is what a unforced, you just start with a random walk. This is what an unforced chain of length, 5,000 links, looks like. I don't know why I wrote uh, thermal equilibrium. It's not thermal equilibrium. It's trying to go somewhere. It's kind of jittering around, but very slowly. It's highly entangled. It's going to take it a long time to get there. We run it two time units, which is the diffusion time that takes a link of the chain to go twice its, distance, twice its size. OK, it just sits there forever and kind of vibrates at you, and nothing really happens. There's an initial period where it swells because you have a random walk and pieces get close to each other, and the steerkin reactions kind of push it all apart. Here's what happens when you have contractile forces that are being turned off and on stochastically. And it's a little more vibratory, if you like, but you don't see anything that looks like a large-scale displacement or anything like that. It's just a little 
little noisier. Things change very slowly. And here's what happens if you have extensile dipoles. Same strength, just opposite sign. Now, the thing about extensile dipoles is it causes things to align, right? You're creating a flow that has a certain structure that if things are in that, in that incident flow will cause them to align, which will align other dipoles, and you create big aligned sections of dipoles, and this whole thing kind of roils itself around. So we're studying this and uh, trying to relate it to some of, of Alexandra's uh, biophysical measurements. So... I'll just leave it at that and try not to overstay my welcome and, and thank you again for inviting me. So in answer, I'm, I'm not sh sure the entirety of your question because it had contained several sentences. And what I'm saying is, if you were to just laser ablate one part of it, you could still have a pushing force coming from the other end, which could still give you oscillations. Yeah, that's right. It can be communicated through the spindle. It can be communicated right. through the fluid. Right. So unless you ablate the pulling uh, forces on both sides, uh, you're not going to be able to tell if it's a pulling or a pushing force. Am I right? Yeah, that would be an interesting experiment to do. I mean, if, if, if you were in uh, anaphase where you have a force distribution anisotropy, then there would be some response to that. Otherwise, I think it would just sit there. There's other things that happen. You know, in, in this model, we're just considering the, the, the spindle is basically a spring that's kind of hard to compress or extend. And that's more or less correct via measurement until you read very late anaphase. And then it turns out it behaves more like a viscous element. And then when you start doing ablating, you, give, you can get some very different behavior. But that's, that's rather late. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's in a, <laughs> it's me, <laughs> yeah, okay, we're just checking, <laughs> yeah. And, and the active agents are on the chain or in the, in the, in the medium? I, I, so, so uh, you can do it one of two ways, you can do it many ways, actually. So in, in this particular simulation, I believe that it looks the same in, in, in the different case, but in this particular simulation, it's a forced dipole where you're just ex having a Stokeslet flow yeah. oppositely oriented on, on two ends of the link. The other thing you can do is you can actually have, so imagine you're dragging something across like this, this uh, talk earlier about nucleosomes being moved around. You could be yanking something on one side and then also moving it, mm. right? And so we have other simulations that look like that and they look basically the same. You can also have, can obviously contractile, you can take your dipole and you can align it transverse to the chain. We haven't explored all of these things as yet. But at the moment, the, the sort of the, when you say extensile or contractile, you mean you have an axis and... And the axis is along, the chain. The axis is along the chain itself. Yeah, that's important. Uh, here, Mike. Oh, yes. In, in this very first uh, simulation, full-scale simulation, you had shown, um, how, how do you deal with the dynein? Are they diffusing around? How oh, do they no, attach, they, detach? We, we really cheat. <laughs> So we assume that there's a continuous distribution of dynein. So there's, there's actually a force that's distributed along the, along the microtubule. We also have later versions, in that, that movie I showed, we have later versions where we have little cargos, which, have a, which are stokeslets, if you like. They're being dragged along, and then you do an opposite force. But here, we're just treating it as a continuum force. We have a pulling force here, and an equal and opposite force on the fluid along the, along the fiber. Like I said, we're, that's really cheap. Oh, so, you know, but, but there's an important point there that, that, you know, it doesn't take that many dynings to drag something around, actually. And so what treating is a continuum, I, I think we need to be more careful that, that if you had just a few dynings, it might not give flows like the ones that I'm showing. So I think we, we need to look at this maybe in some cases a little more carefully. But we haven't as yet. Let's see if I can draw it. So imagine that you have your centrosomes like this, and they're sterically blocked, right, more or less, by, by the 
cargo from going too much in that direction. That's not so important. But, there, but you're, you've, you've reached this kind of equilibrium like that. Now tilt this a little bit, just a little. And let me get it here. And what you've done is you've created, you can, you can grow longer microtubules on one side than, than the other side. That creates a torque imbalance, which is self-reinforcing. Geometry, which is the geometry is central to that. And so let me, let me just say that that property, uh, if you assume, for example, in the cytoplasmic pulling model that you had a completely homogeneous distribution of force generators, you would have that property too, that if you made it a sphere, then you would lose rotation. It wouldn't determine orientation. And so it's known that there's some inhomogeneity, actually, in the, in the way that the, the dynings are laid out. It's also known that if you uh, take, a, take a cell and you deform it so it's more or less spherical, you'll slow down things a bit, but it will still achieve rotation. So there's some inhomogeneity in there somewhere, and now I think this is all telling us now that it's really in the distribution of cortical dining. 